let's look at the agenda. We have two presenters for you today. John Olczyk, who is Principal Analyst at ESG, will start off the webcast and talk about the changing security management landscape. He will be followed by Michael Leland, Chief Technology Officer of Nitro Security, who will talk about the emergence of content-aware SIM. And then we'll transition into Q&A and answer your questions. We have about an hour for the webcast. And with that, we'll get started. Let me introduce to everybody John Olczyk of Enterprise Strategy Group. Take it away, John. Thank you, Jerry, and hello to everyone. Good afternoon, good morning, wherever you're tuning in from. My name is John Olczyk. I'm a principal analyst at the Enterprise Strategy Group. And I'm going to be talking today about the changing security management landscape. Um, I will say quickly that if you go to our website, we've just produced a report on uh, cyber supply chain security that's free and available to everyone and uh, very good data and I suggest you take a look at that because that will support a lot of uh, what I'm talking about. In fact, the data, a lot of the data that I present is from that report. So let me move on to my agenda for today. I'm going to look at security management as it exists in its current iteration. How we got here, what it does, sort of uh, why it does what it does and its limitations. But really what I'll focus on is some new requirements. Um, we believe at ESG that things are changing rapidly, that the needs for SIM or SIEM as you like it uh, are changing rapidly to meet new requirements, uh, new security uh, requirements, and new business requirements. And we'll talk about how those requirements change what's needed in the SIEM platform, and also provide some recommendations on how people can move forward. We think that this is an important topic as we go into 2011. So let's start with how, what things are like today. So this is uh, data from a research report we did earlier in the year, and we asked people to rate what is driving security purchasing, what's driving their security efforts. And it's a little bit difficult to read, but I put a red circle around the top choice, which was regulatory compliance with government and industry regulations. So this is PCI, this is HIPAA or high tech, this is FISMA, this is NERC, etc. Well, we've seen this behavior for a number of years. It's been dominant, and it continues to be dominant in 2010. Now, that's fine. Uh, it's good that regulatory compliance has uh, demanded some controls that people will set up to comply with these particular um, regulations. The problem we see is that historically there's been a real checkbox mentality around security. So if I can meet my compliance audit, then I've past, I've done what I need to do as a security professional, and um, so security is kind of a checkoff box. Well, we've seen that prob a problem with that type of mentality, and I guess it's most pronounced in the federal sector with FISMA. Uh, we found that people were spending, on average, 40 hours to get ready for a FISMA audit, but it was basically going through an audit document and checking off boxes. Now, is that okay? I suppose it's better than nothing, but what it's not doing is dealing with risk. It's not keeping up. So we see that people are less inclined to, uh, to have general security best practices as a driver, or the increasing frequency and sophistication of security threats. And that's really changing rapidly, I and mean, that's increasing, and I'll talk more about that. And we only see security being driven by corporate governance in very sophisticated shops. So that's kind of a leading edge behavior, but we don't see that in the mainstream. So if these are the drivers, how are they doing? How are we doing with those drivers and how are we doing on security? Well, if I go to my next slide here, this is, this is from uh, the cybersecurity report that, was, uh, that I referred to that's posted on our website for free download. Now this was a survey, a real recent survey, of 285 organizations considered to be critical infrastructure by the Department of Homeland Security. So this is thing, these are organizations like um, electric utilities, 
healthcare organizations, financial services organizations, um, food and agriculture production, those kinds of things. Now, we asked them, what do you think? Is the threat is the threat much worse today than it was 24 to 36 months ago? Is it about the same? And what we found was that 68% of respondents said that the threat was much worse today than it was 24 to 36 months ago. I completely concur. Uh, just in this year alone, we've had uh, the Google incident back in January. We've had Stuxnet, which is extremely scary. So these critical infrastructure organizations are very sensitive to this. One thing I'd like to add is you see 28% of the respondents said the threat landscape is much worse today than it was 24 to 36 months ago. Now, when I cut that data and looked at who exactly said that, what's, what's really alarming is the most sophisticated organizations in terms of their security policies, procedures, and technology safeguards, those were the organizations who were saying that things are much worse. So those are the ones who are the most resolute. They're the most. Uh, they're doing the most intelligence. They know what to look for, and they're catching these things. Other companies who aren't as good at security are missing things. So they may not believe things are as bad as they are. So we need better intelligence to to uh, encourage these people uh, that things are pretty bad and things are getting worse, and they need to respond. Now, moving on to my next slide, this is the same population, 285 critical infrastructure organizations. We said, how would you rate your organization's security policies, procedures, and technology safeguards and their ability to address the current threat landscape? Now, this isn't the future landscape that we think is getting worse. This is the current landscape. This is pretty alarming to me. Only 22% of respondents said excellent, that they're able to meet almost all the current threats. And you can see my screaming woman on the left because 20% of critical infrastructure organizations said that their policies, procedures, and safeguards were either poor or fair. Well, that's pretty scary because these are the people who we count on for, again, electric power, to protect our money, to uh, uh, help us when we're ill. So if 20% are not prepared for some type of cyber attack, that's a problem. And that needs to be responded to at, at the highest level, at the federal government level, but also at the tactical level, at, the, uh, at each organization. And part of the problem and part of the solution, as I'll talk about, is the SIEM platform. So moving on to my next slide. Again, the same population. We wanted to know, have these organizations, critical infrastructure organizations, had any kind of security incidents? And, and if so, what kind of security incidents? Now, as you can see, multiple respondents or responses were accepted here. So what we found was that 68% of the critical infrastructure organizations we surveyed had at least one security incident over the past 24 months. And a very high percentage had three or more security incidents, which probably doesn't surprise any of the security professionals on the phone. So a couple of different points about this. Uh, number one, if you look uh, oh, about a third of the way down the page, you'll see a response, uh, data breach due to a lost or stolen, or due to lost or stolen IT equipment. That was 20% of the population. Uh, that usually, in these types of surveys, comes out on top. Now, it's almost on top. It's, uh, it's comparatively close to the number one response. But usually, that is the number one answer. It's people losing their laptops or, or tapes falling off trucks, those kinds of things. What was interesting to me was the other types of responses. So number one was a malicious code attack. We see a higher percentage of, mil uh, or we see growth in malicious code attacks. We see the number of variants increasing. We see the sophistication increasing, the frequency increasing. Not surprising, I guess, to this audience, but c clearly something that's growing. And then we see some, some things that are also, again, from a, a critical infrastructure perspective are frightening. So security incidents related to an unknown security or software vulnerability, the zero-day attacks, um, physical security breaches, probably by insiders, incidents related to configuration errors, 
um, malware infested software. Um, things like uh, configuration errors I talked about, but things like human error just in general. So there are a number of things that we have to protect against. It's not just malware. It's not just insider attacks. It's everything. And when you look at what these things do, what are the ramifications of these security ev events? As I go on to my next slide, well, it really adds up to time and money. So you can see that the number one response was that these types of events lead to a significant, uh, to significant IT time or personnel needed for remediation. So think about computer emergency response teams, detecting problems, isolating problems, and then remediating systems. And this can mean rebuilding systems or rebuilding lots of systems in the case of uh, endpoints, desktops, and in the future, or in the near future, I would think, um, mobile devices as well. Lost productivity. Systems are down, people can't work. But then you get into some things that I think are very important and are really kind of driving changes. And that's, you look at disruption of business processes, disruption of business applications or IT systems. Um, that's when you, you really have to take a hard look in and understand and communicate to your business managers that security in these days, with all of the dependence we have on IT systems, is really a business-critical function. 